thank you all for tuning in. Today's, um, it's been a short month, so we've had two journal clubs this month. Um, so thanks everyone for, for helping with it. Um, uh, as always, I mentioned uh, Dr. Galantiak. Unfortunately, she sent her apologies. Um, she's stuck in a, in a big case, which I'm sure will go well. Um, but I think we should crack on. Um, next slide, please. So this is our disclaimer and the guidelines. Uh, next slide. Um, so I kind of tried to understand what the difference is between Burlington and, and Boston. And um, uh, Burlington is 12 miles northwest of Boston, according to Wikipedia. I tried to look up if there's anything particularly interesting there. And the movie Mall Cop was filmed in 2009 in the Burlington Mall. Oh. And I wonder if it's worth sort of going back to look at it and seeing if there's any colorectal surgeons photobombing the movie. <laughs> um, um, but on a more serious note, um, I'm very grateful for Dr. Abelson, who's a staff surgeon and an assistant professor at Tufts Medical School, who liaised with us and got this up and running. Um, it's great to, to have such an excellent faculty hosting the event. Um, and if I can get him to introduce his city, hospital and faculty, please. Great, thanks Vlad. And uh, great to be joining here with the DCR Journal Club. Um, so it's a little unfair probably from my perspective, because as we were talking about before we got started, uh, I am originally from New York, uh, which has um, uh, had its challenges with Boston, especially when it comes to uh, sports teams. Unfortunately, in the last 20 years, we haven't really been able to compete much. Um, so Boston is, is really obviously known for uh, fantastic sports history, and we'll see if my son ends up becoming a Red Sox fan instead of a New York Mets fan. Uh, as you mentioned, so Mall, I didn't know that about that movie, uh, but it makes a lot of sense because as you can see here, one of the key pictures of Burlington is going to be the Burlington Mall, which is a just a great experience to uh, you know walk through, uh, as like any mall in, in America. Uh, and then I guess I'll just one other thing I'll point out aside from uh, the Leahy Clinic in, in Burlington, uh, you know, big home for pharmaceutical and the medical device industry. So you can do the next slide. Uh, so, um, so Leahy Hospital, so uh, initially started in 1923, Frank Leahy. Uh, so initially it was in Boston, um, moved from Beacon Street to Commonwealth Square as the uh, uh, clinic grew. In uh, 1980, moved to Burlington, Massachusetts. So like you said, 12 miles just northwest of uh, Boston. So that's where we've been since then. Uh, taken a lot of different names over the uh, course of the last almost 100 years. Uh, but in 2017, officially became Beth Israel Leahy Health. Uh, so BIOH is the new partnership. Massachusetts and Boston hospitals always merging and then divorcing and merging and then divorcing. Uh, so right now it's BILH uh, uh, as the institution. And so as far as the, the group, uh, so this is, uh, this is who we have on for tonight. So I'm uh, John Abelson, so one of the newer members of the group. Uh, you're going to have um, uh, Dr. Kuna and Dr. Kleiman are going to provide some commentary for our, our two papers that are going to be discussed by Dr. Prosecco and Dr. Siddhartha, who are two colorectal surgery residents this year. Uh, one of the other panelists, Dr. Sridharis, or Dr. Julia, as her patients affect affectionately call her. And then our special guest, of course, Dr. Peter Marcello. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. So before we get into the, the first paper, we have our poll. So the people on, if, um, if they can kindly uh, choose. So the poll question for today is, what is your preferred approach to the takedown of the splenic flexure for a splenic flexure lesion? Okay, so we'll put this aside. Um, and can I please have the next slide? So the first paper we have is um, by a Japanese group. Uh, the first author is Dr. Fukuoka, um, titled Lymph Node Mapping in the Transverse Colon Cancer Treated Using Laparoscopic Colectomy with D3 Lymph Node Dissection. Uh, Dr. Siddharthan is the fellow presenting the paper. And then, uh, as John said, Dr. Kunin is the staff surgeon who will elaborate and then we'll go with the discussion subsequently. Thank you. All right, thank you for the opportunity for presenting today. So for this paper, the goal was really to discover what the lymph node mapping is for various patients who have transverse colon cancer. 
Really, the optimal surgery for transverse colon cancer remains elusive. The lymph node harvest strategies between Japanese colorectal surgeons and Western colorectal surgeons differs. Japanese surgeons do what we call a D3 lymph node dissection versus in the Western countries, we do a complete mesocolic excision or a high ligation of the vessel. A D3 lymph node dissection is based on taking out the necessary lymph node basin. The goal is to remove the specific feeding vessel for the tumor. The way the Japanese surgeons define this is basically they identify the vessel, they, excuse me, they identify the tumor and then identify the closest vessel to the tumor. If the, if the vessel's within 10 centimeters, that's defined as the feeding vessel. If there's two vessels that are within 10 centimeters, then both of those are defined as the feeding vessel and they often do a, um, take both vessels and that sometimes increases the, what they resect. If there's no vessels within 10 centimeters, they basically just take whichever one's closest. You can go to the next slide. So this was a retrospective review of the patients who underwent a D3 lymph node dissection at this hospital in Tokyo um, for a resection for transverse collecting between 2005 and 2015. The patients were stratified into three different groups for different transverse cancers. They defined the right group as patients who had a cancer in the right side of the transverse colon defined as from the hepatic flexure to the right branch of the middle colic artery. The middle, which was defined as from the right middle uh, from, excuse me, from the right branch of the middle colic to the left branch of the middle colic, and then the left, which is from the left branch of the middle colic artery to the splenic flexure. Postoperatively, the surgeons would map out the lymph nodes for each of the specimens, and then they would compare these pathologic findings with the results of disease free survival and overall recurrence rates. Go to the next slide. So overall, there's 252 patients who were identified who met the, their criteria. The vast majority of these patients had positive lymph nodes, and we'll go specifically kind of through each of the diagrams for where the lymph nodes ended up, were found in the pericolic region for all three groups. There was no differences in postoperative course between the three groups, and there was no differences in five-year survival between the three different groups. The only independent risk factor for, uh, for disease progression was no lymph node positivity, and that was any lymph node, whether it be in any of the three ranges. So kind of the meat and potatoes of this paper is in these next diagrams. So this first picture shows a, the right colon transverse cancer. So these are defined from the hepatic flexure to the, first, the right branch of the middle colic. And you can see in the first diagram, this is the patients who, ex, who received an extended right colectomy. And the second diagram is the patients who received just a transverse colectomy, which is just a ligation of the middle colic artery. And we can see that there's no positivity of the nodes in the iliocolic even though these patients did receive an uh, receive their extended right, but all the lymph nodes are really defined into the middle colic or sometimes into the right colic. The interesting fact with this diagram is that there was no skipped lesions. So there was no patients who had a positive lymph node at the origin of the middle colic or the RCA who didn't have positive pericolic nodes. We can go to the next slide. Um, so this, this was the middle colic, uh, the middle transverse cancers, excuse me. And we can see here that they, again, some patients received a right colectomy and most of the patients received a transverse colectomy. And this is again, based off of which they identified as the feeding vessel. But again, we can see that their lymph nodes that were found in the iliocolic region were completely negative. And that all of the majority of lymph nodes are found in the pericolic area or at the base of the, uh, of the middle colic. And go to the last slide. And so for those patients who had a left-sided transverse cancer, we can see that the majority of these received a left uh, colectomy. And that there was a few cases where these patients did have uh, positive lymph nodes along the left colic artery, but then again, the majority were in the middle colic and often this was the left branch of the middle colic. And again, in this uh, the patients, there was no skip lesions. So patients who had a positive node at the base of the middle colic had a positive pericolic node as well. So overall, their conclusions were that the laparoscopic surgery uh, for transverse colectomy was feasible. The majority of the lymph nodes were in the targeted lymph node dissection, and these were predominantly in the pericolic regions or those lymph nodes that were right along the marginal artery. The D3 lymphadenectomy can, uh, basically their conclusion was the D3 lymphadenectomy can help guide adequate lymph node harvest for transverse colon cancers, regardless of the location. Thank you. Thank you very much for this succinct summary. Um, can I please get Dr. Kunin to, to make some comments? Thank you. 
Certainly. Thank you all um, for coming tonight and um, and participating in this. I, I found this paper um, pretty interesting in, in, in a conceptual way. Um, I was going to throw to Raga and I'm going to throw you a question and have you answer it in a couple of minutes. But but kind of what is the what is the take home message from this paper? I want you to think about that as, as I chat a little bit here. Um, so I think this does support the regional approach to um, lymphatic spread of colon cancer, unlike some other um, cancers. Um, and, and going back, I remember um, um, when I was a fellow, Tom Reed talking about um, studies that they were doing well before I was in training, doing lymph node mapping, sentinel lymph node mapping for colon cancer. These studies were, were somewhat abandoned because of the concept that that. I think has been relatively well established in colon cancer that does does almost always follow a predictable pattern of spread through the lymph nodes. Um, but it was reassuring to see that in the one of the more difficult locations in the transverse colon that this pattern um, is consistent as well. Um, one of I think the challenges that well, the, the most the most obvious criticism which we always throw at the the Asian um, cancer papers when we look at lymph node dissection is is BMI, that the patient population is really somewhat different compared to um, um, what we see here. Um, and I'm going to actually apologize. Along those lines, I'm, I'm in downtown Boston and a block away from my house, the Journey, Journey and Toto, those bands are um, starting a concert right about right now. And That's I can tell awesome. you that, that um, the people making the noise outside my house do not have a BMI of 17, um, and I would not want to do a transverse collecting on any of them. <laughs> so um, our population is a little bit different here, and the number of times that, that we go looking for the middle colic artery and, and simply can't, can't find it laparoscopically, and I, I um, don't really hesitate to convert to an open operation to really identify the root of the middle colic if I'm um, concerned about safety or adequate um, transection. Um, is not insignificant. Um, so uh, along the lines of that, um, I was also just just in terms of different different approach to cancer management. Um, I was really pretty interested in this concept that they they were um, selecting the patient's operation based on the clinical staging that they made preoperatively, um, based on both the endoscopy um, findings. Um, and then also um, based on, on CT imaging. So they, they approached uh, the operations with a clinical stage in mind at their tumor boards. This was my interpretation of the way that they did this and then selected whether or not they were going to do what we would consider to be a true high ligation, taking the entire middle colic artery or do a selective ligation, taking one of the branches based on whether or not they thought this was a stage three or four cancer or a stage zero through two cancer. And the lower stage cancers got a lesser resection, was my my understanding. Um, so then, when they they went to compare outcomes um, and even even the adequacy of lymph node harvest and lymph node positivity, it really seemed to me that those groups that they were comparing were not necessarily the same. If you're doing a different operation based on preoperative clinical staging, um, you you're you're doing a different operation and comparing lower stage cancers to higher stage cancers. Um, so I had a bit of a, a challenge with that. Um, I was pretty interested in another question that, that wasn't discussed, which was this concept of clinical staging of colon cancer, which we just don't really talk about in the US very much. We, the way when I, when I approach this with patients, I say, you know, we can get a sense of maybe your, maybe your lymph nodes are involved or not based on the CT. We, maybe I can see this, the, the tumor on your CAT scan, but most of the time you can't identify the primary tumor on CAT scan. Um, but but I was pretty curious about how good are they doing with this? So what is the correlation between their clinical staging and then their pathologic staging? Does that is, is that an effective way? And then with that, um, as we've shifted to neoadjuvant therapy for um, many different cancers, including rectal cancer, is that something if every now and then we talk about doing neoadjuvant chemotherapy for an advanced stage colon cancer. So is this, is this opening a door to um, something else we should be thinking about? Um, I think in terms of the conclusions that they make about um, recurrence rates and complication rates, it's, it's pretty difficult to really hang much on those conclusions saying that there's not a difference between the different groups um, just because of the low numbers. Um, um, that being said, the the 
diligence of the surgeons in lymphing out these, the lymph, uh, mapping out the, the lymph nodes after um, the four or five hour operations is, is really impressive and commendable. And, um, and I'm not sure that, that us Americans would have the patience to go about that at the end of a long day. Um, just the one other comment that I, that I found um, interesting was in, when they look at the adjuvant chemotherapy given, I was surprised at how much um, simple Zalota was used in terms of the adjuvant chemotherapy. We don't usually see that unless there is um, a contraindication to um, oxaliplatin um, based chemotherapy. So I wasn't sure what the reason for that was in their series, but it seems that maybe close to half the patients received just Zalota. So I'm going to kick it back to Raga now in terms of what do you think that what's the take home here? What what do we take out of this? It's a great question. And I was trying to fully get a grasp of what it was. So I think the take home is that the transverse colon cancers drain predominantly to the middle colic artery. Um, the left side ones seem like they may have some drainage, so less the left colic, but the right side very rarely, if ever, does it drain the ileal colic. But I don't think that's the reason that we would do an extended that's not the main reason you're doing that. And so I don't necessarily know that it's going to change your practice necessarily, but I think it's important to know that the drainage for these cancers is to the middle colic. And I, but I think your point about the weight difference is really important. Like their average BMI in the study is 21, which I think is pretty unheard of at least in, in, at the Leahy Clinic. Um, so my take home point is that the transverse colon cancers do drain to the middle colic artery and it's important to get a ligation of that artery in specifically. Thanks for that. Uh, those are some very interesting points. I think we should explore a bit um, further. I have to say, I don't know if I'm more jealous of the physique of the Japanese patients or the Japanese surgeons, um, <laughs> personally. Um, you, 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 um, one of the things that I get confused about sometimes is the definition of what is the right extended right hemicolectomy versus what is a subtotal colectomy, particularly given that there is variability in the vascular supply to the middle colic. Um, and it might be worth sort of having a our group consensus of what we think, you know, what is the difference? And the same can be sort of asked about the transverse colectomy versus left hemicolectomy. John, um, I'll direct all the questions to you and then you can sort them out. <laughs> All right, I think we're up for Dr. Julia. All right, um, I do want to sort of um, just the point before I answer the extended right hand colectomy, just say that I do support Angela's point about the clinical stage not being sort of um, tallied up or mentioned specifically in this article. Because I think at the end of the day, the question is what operation should I do for what patient? And I couldn't figure that out based on sort of the information they were presenting to me because there was sort of a whole other layer of staging that was going on clinically prior to them showing up for this operation. But when I think about an extended right, I think about, okay, I'm essentially taking the, the middle colic and so both branches. And so that's typically my sort of definition of it. My anastomosis usually is an ileocolic side to side on the left side of the patient's abdomen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think I would think the same way, but I think it is sometimes confusing. Um, uh, now, my, my next question, and it kind of goes towards the point of the um, sort of lymph node involvement. The primary motivation for an aggressive lymphadenectomy in these patients, is it to um, better prognosticate, as in probably, you know, upstage them, or is it actually with curative intent? And does that matter in how we approach it? Peter's up. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Vlad, uh, as chair of the division, I want to thank you so much for letting us uh, partake in this DCR journal view. And Susan, it's really a lot of fun. And, and I guess my, this is the question we've been asking forever. Are lymph nodes, are they the predictors or are they the governors? In other words, the more you take out, the better the patient does, or do you better just stage? And we still, to this day, I don't think we have that answer. Um, but I think uh, what we do say is that um, I think what we see in the trend is take out less colon, but more lymph nodes to the region you're taking out. And I think that's probably sort of the main point I see in this article is that you're still going to take out all the nodes in that node in that draining basin. Um, and I think uh, we don't know yet still for colon cancer, whether lymph nodes are predictors or governors. We like to think of surgeons that they're governors, 
that we do a better cancer and they do a better outcome, but I don't know if we can really say that for sure. Others? Uh, thank you. And thank you very much for supporting the Journal Club because it's only as good as the people that support it. Um, now, in terms of, I've had a few cases, particularly in bigger people where I've selected to do an extended right or a subtotal and the lymph node count is through the roof, you know, 40, 50. And then I sort of wonder, what does that actually mean? How many of those lymph nodes are in the ileocolic distribution? And it's kind of, it's, it's fool's gold in a way. Um, do, do you um, have any protocols where you um, get the pathologist to divide or, or, or tell you, you know, the significance of, of a high lymph node count? John, you want to take that? What do you, what do you think about when you do it? Yeah, I, I would say no. Um, and just sort of to maybe it was Angela's point before, I remember in residency, Dr. Milsom talking about how the Japanese will do that. Well, they will actually dissect out every lymph node and provide that to the pathologist so you can actually get that information. And so I know yeah, during some of our tumor boards, you'll hear, okay, zero of 60 lymph nodes. And then, you know, medical oncologists will say, wow, what a great surgery. Um, but no, okay. Vlad, I think you're exactly right. That That's not necessarily prognostic or meaning anything versus if there were 20 lymph nodes. We don't get that, but Raga, what did we do today when we did this, you know, resection in a woman with a BMI of like 36? You know, when we took out the ilocolic pedicle as we were getting it freed up, what did we isolate? Do you remember? We did isolate a lymph node, but it was from a, it was probably from the tattoo. So we knew that one was a draining lymph node for sure. So Vlad, I think some of us will, will actually isolate the high pedicle lymph node. Like I will grab the most proximal ilocolic lymph node or the middle colic lymph node, and I'll pluck that out myself so I get at least one lymph node in my specimen. And I send that out separately. Uh, and if that node is positive, because we don't know where the other ones are, I think that that does not bode well for the patient. If the patient has two positive lymph nodes, but my most proximal node is negative, I think we all feel a little bit better. I don't know others, do others do that? Do you do that, Vlad, in your practice? Uh, uh, when I see it, uh, I, I do. Um, and, and occasionally I would strip the, um, the vessel. I usually use Ligasure to sort of ligate the, the vessel, so I do have to strip it fairly closely. But I don't do it routinely. Um, but it does also, back to the point of, you know, high lymph node count, that doesn't equate to a lot of lymph nodes at the middle colic necessarily. And that really worries me. And, and I think in general, that's probably the cancers in the colon and rectum, which are the worst staged, you know, in what we treat. Um, it's also the sh oftentimes the shortest pedicle. And so the, just the, the simple distance, the length of the middle colic artery is often very short. So the, the distance that the tumor would have to travel you know, is, is shorter. Um, and that worries me um, in terms of just the chance of, of central spread. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think for me, pelvic bleeding is less scary than pancreas bleeding. Um. <laughs> Middle colics can really, uh, they, you know, and I think we'll, we can talk about that in terms of how you isolate them, but I like to find each vessel and divide them rather than just taking the energy device and going blindly across the mesentery, not knowing where the vessel is. That doesn't make you feel really good when you get into bleeding. Yeah, um, the next question I have, and again, it, I think Dr. Coonan mentioned or touched upon it, was the difference in the right colon cancers in the study versus the transverse colon cancers. And I, I'm just wondering, is it because of the difference in the lumen of the bowel that they are presenting earlier? Um, is, is that your experience that they're earlier cancers or is it genuinely a selection bias in this paper? Really want to crack. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, I think some of it is just the numbers. There are different um, percentages in terms of the lymph node involvement for the right cancers in this. Um, and I, I think it probably is just a statistical anomaly that, that the numbers are relatively small. And so we picked up a significant value that's not really significant. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is there was really no comment about the management of the omentum um, and the sort of gastroepiploic um, arcade. So um, what do you guys do? Um, and if you can maybe break it up into, you know, proximal transverse, middle transverse and, and splenic flexure, 
do you do a different approach to the momentum or do you always take it out never take it out that kind of stuff Dave, jump in david yeah um <clears throat> You know, I, I tend to try to leave most of the momentum, but I don't take the momentum flush with the colon. Uh, I try to leave a little bit attached. It, it worries me if there is a little bit of peritumoral spread, especially if it's a bulkier tumor, then a lot of times you'll have momentum that's really kind of stuck on it. And I think that should really be taken off on block. I, I definitely don't get into that to try to separate it. Um, so then I'll, I'll definitely leave a lot of momentum. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of times uh, separation of the momentum off of the transverse colon is really helpful to really open up the lesser sac fully and get the stomach out of the way. Um, otherwise, especially as you're coming up to the splenic flexure, the short gastrics can kind of bring that stomach really close. And sometimes you can be a little closer to the greater curve than, than you think you are as you're coming up to mobilize the splenic flexure. So I like to separate the momentum off separately. And I've, I've evolved that in the last five years. Earlier on, I, I kind of took it all at once with the mesentery. Um, but I found that separating it first really allows you to do a much more precise lesser sac dissection. So Vlad, I would say this as an institution, we'll take momentum if it's adherent to the tumor, uh, but if it's not, we generally don't feel like you have to do a mastectomy as part of a curable colon cancer operation. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Um, now, the last question I've got here, and then maybe we can just explore the chat, is to do with visceral fat um, in, in the intra sort of intraoperative decision making. And again, going back to Dr. Coonan's point about converting to, to an open uh, procedure, maybe for the middle colleagues, is the decision of, um, say, doing an extended right or a subtotal uh, compared to a segmental based on uh, visceral fat for you or, or not? Because I do find in bigger people, it's easier for me just to start on the right and just go clockwise and, and take everything on block. I think, I mean, a transverse colectomy, if I'm doing that laparoscopically, then I, like Peter said, isolate the middle colic artery by creating a window on either side of the artery before I divide any vessel. So I really like to see it and I like to see behind it um, so that I make sure that I'm not um, in the pancreas or not in the stomach um, when I take that artery. Sometimes with, with the visceral fat, especially if it's a significant mesenteric fat, it's just impossible to even hold up the transverse colon adequately to be able to visualize that. Just the weight of the mesentery is so great. So in cases like that, I completely agree with you that coming from the right side and coming across from the, the right to the left on the mesentery um, can, can allow much better exposure. Um, in terms of converting to open, I think, especially early in my practice when I was a new attending, I had a very low threshold to do the whole mobilization, get to the point of division of the middle colic artery, and then be worried that I was going to pee my pants in the process of taking the middle colic. So just isolate an extraction incision overlying the middle colic pedicle so that I could take that open and have my hands on it. Um, I've, I've gained a little bit more confidence with, with years um, maybe not wisdom, but, but a little more confidence. And so I have a lower threshold to continue that laparoscopically now, but, um, but I would encourage folks to not hesitate to just be safe with the middle colic artery. Thank you. Um, just looking at the chat, um, there's a comment from uh, Dr. Pat Silla. Um, thank you for joining, by the way. I, I can't quite understand what you mean. Maybe um, if you, oh, if, there's just another one. Um, would you like to speak? Would you like to elaborate on that? Or are you happy with the- yeah, Speak up, Pat, come on, say something. Oh, I was just waiting for my turn patiently, listening there to all go, the babe. experts in the room. You know, it's a Lee, it's a Lee he, uh, you know, dream come true here, dream team. Um, I mean, I, I really like your comments. I think the, you know, you, you mentioned the Japanese and Korean experience. And I think it's really the concept of the more proximal node or the central node. You know, which which I think it's not so much about the number, I agree, but more about the most central node, which it is, if it is positive, obviously, you can potentially upstage patients who've been understaged by conventional CT scan. So I think it's an important concept. If you see an enlarged node that was missed on CT scan, this is a chance to actually, you know, incorporate that in your specimen, as, as Peter mentioned. But, um, you know, it's it's really the, the, the concept that they really defined and correlated with some improved outcome when they actually go after the central nodes. Um, which is, we have not replicated in, the, you know, in our experience yet. Thank you for that. 
Um, now, in the interest of time, let's move on to the next paper. And uh, the paper is called What is the Optimal Elective Colectomy for Splenic Fracture Cancers? And the fellow presenting it is Dr. Kuchako. Hope I pronounced that correctly. And Dr. Kliman is the staff surgeon that would start with our discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, and good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'll take a couple minutes and try and touch on the important points of the second article. Uh, what is the optimal elective colectomy for splenic flexure cancer? So uh, this article was published by the Grecar Group in France, uh, uh, and it's a very interesting topic as uh, the optimal treatment for splenic flexure masses is not always straightforward. Uh, so splenic flexure tumors are associated with an increased risk of bowel obstruction and worse prognosis than other colonic locations. These tumors are special as they're in watershed areas with dual lymphatic drainage. Uh, given this, there is some controversy in the ideal surgical procedure to address an adequate lymph node harvest and minimize the interoperative difficulty and postoperative comorbidities. Prior studies suffered from being monocentric and retrospective. Uh, since most study populations were small, many of these included pooled resection groups that were heterogeneous and it really limits the applicability of their conclusions. Um, although this study did remain retrospective, it was a, a multi-centered study and it was really aimed to compare the elective use of the three most common procedures in treating these masses. And uh, these procedures being the splenic flexure colectomy, uh, the left hemicolectomy, and then the subtotal colectomy. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, patients were included in this study if they were undergoing an elective surgery and they did not show any evidence of synchronous metastatic disease. Uh, the tumor had to be located in the distal third of the transverse colon uh, to the first part of the descending colon. Uh, only patients undergoing surgery with curative intent were included in this study. Uh, the splenic flexure colectomy, they, they define these very specifically in terms of their ligation. Uh, so the splenic flexure colectomy underwent high ligation in the left branch of the middle colic and uh, left colic arteries. Uh, the left hemicolectomy added the inferior mesenteric artery to this, and then the subtotal colectomy included the iliocolic and right colic vessels in this resection. Patients were excluded if they underwent emergent surgery, had prior stent insertion, had prior history of colectomy, or a history of inflammatory bowel disease. Overall, they were able to include 313 patients over eight years into this study. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, taking a look at baseline patient characteristics, you'll notice that there's a significant difference in approach to the different colectomies. Uh, the subtotal colectomies were nearly always done open. Uh, the segmental colectomies and left hemicolectomies were also more often done open than laparoscopically. Uh, and it, it's worth noting, uh, especially since I'm from Leahy, that almost none of these cases were done hand assist uh, with that approach. Uh, the, the type of anastomoses were also significantly different between these groups. Uh, both the splenic flexure colectomy and the subtotal colectomies were most often hand sewn. Um, and you might also note that in 57 patients who underwent the left hemicolectomy, a quarter of them required additional maneuvers to create tension free anastomoses. Uh, uh, they document a leak rate between 5 and 11 percent, uh, which was not significantly different between groups. Um, even though we did see these differences, uh, the clavian dindo score was not significantly different between the groups, which suggests they were relatively well matched for preoperative morbidity. Uh, next slide, please. The path results did show some significant differences between the groups. Uh, as one would expect, the resected specimens were significantly smaller in the more limited colectomies. Um, in both splenic flexure colectomies and left hemicolectomies, the longitudinal resection margin was less than five centimeters in nearly a third of the cases. Similarly, in these two groups, less than 12 lymph nodes were harvested in nearly a third of these cases. Uh, this data suggests that at least a third of these patients undergoing a splenic flexure colectomy and left hemicolectomy received what we would consider a less than adequate cancer resection. 
while we talked about this in the last slide, the Clavian Dindo scores were not significantly different between groups. Uh, those with stage zero and one disease received a subtotal colectomy less often. This may suggest that there was surgeon bias for a smaller resection and what was clinically perceived as less advanced disease. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, you know, overall in the study, we, we do see splenic flexure colectomy is the most performed procedure with these masses. Uh, they compared survival data after propensity score matching using pathologic characteristics of the cancer and postoperative morbidity. After this matching, there was no survival difference between the three groups. Uh, this was an interesting approach to use propensity score matching using uh, postoperative criteria to match these patients rather than preoperative criteria. Uh, um, so it's, it's worth noting. And the author's final conclusion was that the splenic flexure colectomy is safe and feasible and provides similar results to other options. Uh, they do acknowledge their limitations of resection margins and lymph node harvests. So overall, I think this study presents good comparative data between these three approaches and, and the authors do acknowledge the limitations of their data, but uh, some of this data I think uh, is worth mentioning and, and deserves a little more discussion. So um, I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks. Uh, thanks very much for, for the assisting summary. Um, let's go to Dr. Clement, um, please. Thank you so much, Vlad. Uh, thank you, Bobby, for that really nice summary. Um, good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many people here, so many familiar faces on the call and, and new ones. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for the DCR staff for putting this together. Um, this is a really, really interesting study to me. I love that this study was done, and I love that we're talking about this because this is a one of those topics that I think every single one of us on this call who's done an operation on a splenic flexure cancer can relate to the um, uncertainty and um, the relatively poor data available guiding us on what to do with these lesions. Um, you know, as karma would have it, um, a week and a half ago, Bobby and I were in the OR doing a, what we thought was gonna be a robotic sigmoidectomy for a cancer. And we put the camera in and no tattoo to, was to be found. Um, so we did an intra-op scope and sure enough, there's the tumor sitting right in the splenic flexure. And there's always a moment of deep sigh when that happens. And you know you're in for a much longer day than you thought you were going to be, um, no matter what you decide to do. Um, you know, when I approach these clinical scenarios, I really think that there's two separate questions that I'm asking myself. Uh, the first question is, what operation do I need to do for the cancer? What's the best oncologic cancer? What lymph nodes do I think are important for draining that tumor? And I think that there is a difference depending on where on the splenic flexure the tumor falls. We kind of saw that a bit with, uh, with the first paper, which I think led really nicely into this one about the lymph node mapping. Um, whether you think the middle colic is more important or is the left colic more important or are they both important? Um, and so th that's the first and the biggest question to ask. And then the second question has to be, what kind of pieces of bowel do I want left behind for my anastomosis? Um, what do I think is going to technically be feasible and what's going to work well in terms of function and quality of life for the patient? And that's a very important question too. And I think you never wanna compromise cancer first and foremost, but you have to think about your next part. And sometimes that means sacrificing some colon to do a better anastomosis uh, with equivalent quality of life afterwards. Um, and that might mean taking out a lot of colon that probably doesn't make a difference for cancer. Um, and so that's kind of frames the way I approach these in general. In terms of this study, the, um, I think it was a really, really great question that they asked. And I think that the Grecar group has a very long history of doing very nice, high quality, multi-center articles uh, or studies similar to this um, to answer other important questions. It's a great example of how you can pool data from institutions to get really nice numbers um, for relatively rare conditions. That being said, there are certainly some methodological flaws here, um, mostly related to the fact that this was a purely retrospective study. Uh, and a couple of those things have already been pointed out, but I wanna highlight. 
In terms of generalizability, there's two things that really jump out at me here. The, the biggest one, which Bobby highlighted, was the oncologic uh, outcome in terms of uh, lymph node harvest and, uh, and radial margins, or sorry, longitudinal margins. One third of patients in all three groups um, fail to meet what all of us and every society would, would consider the fundamentals for a sound oncologic operation. If their question was specifically focused on is splenic flexure resection adequate for a splenic flexure cancer, and the results showed that one third of patients had fewer than 12 lymph nodes, then the conclusion would be that it's oncologically inadequate. Um, but they found that one third of their patients in all three groups had less than 12 lymph nodes, which really is very concerning about either their surgical technique or the pathologic analysis that's being performed, that they're not looking for enough lymph nodes. And that's, that's a concern in terms of generalizing these results. Now, the authors acknowledge that and say, well, there, was, there didn't appear to be any upstaging um, because the, the incidence of stage three cancers and those who received chemo were equal among the three groups. But I have a hard time accepting that as an adequate uh, way of accounting for that limitation of this study. Uh, and I think that really, it, it makes a big, big question mark in my head about what we can really do with these data. Um, one thing that I, and then also for generalizability, Bobby pointed out 93% of the subtotal colectomies were open. Uh, and overall there was a 21% conversion rate. And almost nobody did laparoscopic hand-assisted surgery, which um, Bobby kind of alluded to the fact that we're very big fans of hand-assist surgery at Leahy. Um, you know, part of that all comes from our shared roots with Milsom's approach and what was done at Cornell before some of us came up here. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we wouldn't have that many open surgeries, I think, in, in general for this. That I don't think has a big impact on the cancer outcome, but in some of the other outcomes, I think it, it could impact. So that's a question about generalizability. I think one thing that this study does highlight really well is how technically difficult these operations can be, uh, highlighted by the fact that 25% of their patients needed either a Turnbull or a Deloyer to be performed in order to get attention-free anastomosis. Um, that's something that's often pimped and, and asked about. Um, not many of us do that on a routine basis. And so these are, you know, we all have to have them in our back pocket. Um, but these are hard, and these are really, really hard surgeries. I think that the authors really do highlight well. One of the biggest omissions here from the fact that it was retrospective is that there is no data offered on function and quality of life, um, which I think is a really huge here because there seems to be an implicit bias about showing that subtotal colectomy is maybe overkill here, and why are we doing subtotal colectomies, but not actually talking about what the quality of life is on these patients afterwards. Uh, my experience is that if you can save some of the sigmoid colon and do an ilio descending or an ilio proximal sigmoid anastomosis, most of those patients do exceptionally well. And I have many patients with not much colon left who have you know two to three bowel movements a day and are very very happy. Um, and so you know that is an important consideration here because why why bring in this question of an oncologically unacceptable outcome? if really a function of a subtotal colectomy can be shown to be equal to these other resections. So that's a really important piece that I would love to be filled in here. I think really what they're trying to show is that a splenic flexure resection is not inferior. Uh, I, and so it kind of is phrased as a non-inferiority study, but it was done retrospectively, so they can't really do that analysis. I think really what this says is that, wow, this is a really interesting question. This was maybe not the best way to definitively answer it, but maybe this is fuel to, to um, formulate a prospective non-inferiority trial where you're trying to show that splenic flexure resection is not worse than a subtotal colectomy. Uh, and I think that would be an interesting direction for the future. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. That's very comprehensive. It actually covers most of the questions that I've had pre-prepared. Um, now, one thing that I'd like to just confirm or maybe discuss was you've mentioned you know, the perfect anastomosis. We all do them perfect anastomosis, but somehow do them differently. Um, what, what do you actually do for colocolonic anastomoses? And do you have a, uh, a unit policy or are you all uh, different in your approaches? Lee, you wanna jump in there? Give the lay perspective. Julia, go ahead. Uh, so what I would say is that um, we definitely have a bias towards 
for a cold colonic anastomosis, if it's out of the reach of an E8 stapler, of doing a hand sewn anastomosis, typically single layer interrupted 3O PDS. Um, I think for any splenic flexure resection that I do with a colonic anastomosis, that has been my sort of go-to anastomosis. Leak tested, and you know, so far so good in terms of my practice. Yeah. Um, I will say that um, I think what Dave had been alluding to is that you know, a side-to-side -side colic anastomosis is a very nice one that you can do without sort of the you know song and dance of doing a hands-on anastomosis. But I would say, Vlad, that for the institution, you know, we, we do air leak testing. And so that's a big part of what we've done based upon our own experience and our writings from Rocco before. And even hand sewn anastomosis. Like, if I saw every stitch, why do I need to air leak test? When we looked at our own study, there was a 10% leak rate in hand sewn when they got air leak tested. So we always air leak test and we like an endoscopic assessment. And I think that's, for many of us, our backgrounds with Milsom or being here. So endoscopic evaluation and I think air leak testing keeps our leak rates to be lower. And we're not afraid to do a hand-sewn colocolonic anastomosis. We also as a group routinely place a metal clip on a hand-sewn anastomosis for identification, for radiographic identification out of concern if there is need to leak to, to um, do a water-soluble NMR or CT just to assess. Um, you can always identify where your anastomosis is. Just like you do for a stricture plastic, right? Yeah, that, that's um, something Dr. Marcello told me last week, and I actually did it already. I nice, think it's a good best idea. <laughs> yeah. Tracy Hall will be proud of you. Right. <laughs> um, so, now, one last question, and then we'll skip to the poll. And yeah. my last question is related to, in this study, there was a significant increase in the adoption of laparoscopic surgery when they dichotomized the, um, the data from 2006 to 2010, and then 11 to 14. Sort of taking that a little bit aside, um, uh, uh, David, I think you mentioned robotic surgery. When you look at papers that, that describe using robotics, where, where do you look at the cutoff of, right, from now on, you know, this is meaningful data versus this is still experimental data? Yeah, so um, I think the data on robotic colon surgery is very, very immature. Uh, in, 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 in not immature, I mean, immature in the sense that we don't have much and we don't have any long-term outcomes. I think, you know, I think we have better data coming out of ROLAR and things like that about uh, the use in the pelvis with rectal cancer surgery. But for colon cancer surgery, you know, I think it's certainly inconclusive. I think that there are several um, potential benefits from the use of robotics with colon cancer surgery like this. I think the biggest one that I see um, uh, Pat Silla's comment uh, on the side is maybe alluding to is maybe, you know, certainly introducing the um, more percentage of people comfortable with doing an intracorporeal anastomosis. Um, and I think many more people are willing to attempt that robotically than straight lap. Uh, and I think that's a very nice anastomosis to make here, a side to side isoperistaltic intracorporeal stapled anastomosis, I think is a great option for an awkward left sided anastomosis. Um, and uh, that that's too high for a um, for an EEA. Um, so that's where I think probably the best the the best benefit comes in with robotics is just increasing the people's willingness to try that. Otherwise, surgery, surgery, whether it's with a robot or straight slip blacks. Fantastic. All right, thank you. Let's let's jump to the poll results, and which kind of is a bit of a segue in terms of the breakup between hand assist, laparoscopic and robotic. Um, I, I personally, I, I, um, I know my limitations and I'm a short person with pretty sort of fat hands and I always worry about the hand assist not being able to reach and see anything. Um, do you think it's, do you think there's a um, sort of a hand component to it? Is it a technique component to it or? or is it just an institution-based uh, uh, preference? I have to say that the size of my hand port depends a lot on what fellow I have working with me. And that, that I think is a, should be a deciding factor in terms of your practice is if you have small, small foldable hands and you can keep a very small extraction site, um, then the hand assist becomes a lot more appealing. If I have to make a, 
nine centimeter incision to get my fellow's hand in the belly, then it's it's a much less appealing uh, approach. You know, I, 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 I'm very biased towards hand assist surgery from just the way I was trained in my, my practice. I think that, I think people overemphasize the, uh, the size of the hand issue, uh, in the belly. It's really about how you position your hand. And, you know, I have size seven and a half hands, but you know, it's not that extra half a centimeter diameter that blocks the view. It's the way that it's positioned intracorporeally that makes the difference. And I also don't know any data to say that an eight centimeter fan and steel is worse than a six centimeter fan and steel. I think there's very, very little difference to the patients with that. So I don't stress too much about the size of the fan and steel. I think that's, that's a great answer. Um, thank you. Um, just in the interest of time, um, and, and I think we've had a great discussion, at least I, I've loved it. Um, let's, let's move on to the next thing. And the next thing is um, a chat with our special guest, uh, Dr. Peter Marcello. Uh, very fortunate to have him here, of course. Um, we all know him as a leader in colorectal surgery. Um, he's an inspirational speaker. I think he's been involved in multiple podcasts, uh, certainly behind the knife. Um, and I think he's, uh, he's been a large part of advancing laparoscopic and uh, laparoendoscopic surgery. Um, and the focus of our quick chat today is to, um, as to the question of how do you leave um, uh, your mind to new ideas? Uh, because I guess it's very easy in the start of one's career to sort of, you know, there's not much crowded space in one's mind, at least that's how I feel. But as you gain wisdom and you gain um, a technique, I think changing things becomes a lot more challenging. Um, and so how do you, how do you balance that? Um, and maybe you can give us some examples. Yeah, I think part of this is, you know, after 24 years of experience, what do you learn? You learned that there are a lot of things you, you did early on that didn't make sense then, but maybe they make sense now. And your mind always has to be able to move. Uh, like when I'm with Raga and we're suturing, I'm like, we're going to angle this needle like we do for Thames. You got to remember, Thames wasn't even around when I started. You know, I had to learn a lot of stuff along the way. I think the, the main concept overall, what I've seen is we're minimizing. We're, we're minimizing our incisions or, and we're trying to achieve the same goals. And I'd say the same is true. And I know Scott Steele's on for, for Cleveland, you know, for, for Crohn's disease. You know, if you had isolated Crohn's uh, in the colon, they got a total collectively when it first started. And then now we're doing segmental resections because we have ways of doing things less invasively. I think also the mindset of, well, you're less invasive, but you know, we say, well, you're the hand guy, they say. Well, realize I did about six or 700 straight lap procedures before we even put the hand in. And I was actually the one who got Dr. Milson to put his hand in, who was a guy who was like anti that. And I think the goal here is to maximize uh, the approach for the patient that minimizes the incision. You know, and if I got a guy who was 6'5 and 280, an eight centimeter fan steel is a beautiful thing. And in that, and not only because uh, it heals well, but there are hernia rates and, and, and we'll get into some of that. But what I've really learned is like, there are some old things that come back and, I'll, and we'll talk about hernia and, and the hernia that we hate the most, which is like a parastomal hernia, right? And so I've tried everything, trying to put meshes underneath or, or something else. And, and then I, I went back to old school and in old school, uh, I'll ask Bobby, uh, who described a natural sugar baker, Bobby? Who do we talk about? So we, we typically talk about uh, Gallagher and his technique. John Gallagher, right? Where is he from? Uh, he was from England. I think uh, he spent a couple of minutes at uh, St. Mark's before he went to Leeds University. That's right, Leeds Infirmary. And, right, and he described this in 1958 about dissecting out uh, under the um, white line of toll, under the peritoneum, and coming up, creating a stoma. And he did it back then uh, for um, trying to prevent the lateral gutter causing a bowel obstruction. But he also found that the hernia rate was a lot less. And, and I was at a meeting, and if Scott at Steele is still on, give a shout out to Scott, uh, and Avery Walker for my first uh, Behind the Knife. Uh, Avery, good to see you. A anyway, so I was at a meeting in Midwest Colorectal, and Al Thorson, Talk about doing a Gallagher, doing a retroperitoneal approach. And I'm like, that looks pretty neat. And then I saw Joel Lawa do it. And it's a matter of taking an old concept and bringing it back in. And it makes a lot of sense that you could um, 
create a natural sugar baker by tunneling under. And for a colostomy, I think it's relatively simple if you have a long enough to, to spread under uh, and come uh, make the incision above, go under the rectus muscle out laterally and then incise the lateral sheath. And then from there, just carry it down into the peritoneum. And you pull the colon up through and it seems kind of crazy, but you can do it in a straight lap case using the EEA sizer coming from the middle going out to the side and then pull the colon up through and it does create a natural sugar baker. And, and I, I think we need to find different approaches taking an old concept from 1958 and bringing it forward. The other, the next thing we talked about was a fan and steel. Why do I love fan and steels? Because they don't get hernias. And, and when I do a laparoscopy, I love, I can do a straight lap right. And that's what um, uh, Rog and I did today. And I used to almost always extract in the midline. But if you look at midline extractions, um, a midline extraction for a right colectomy uh, laparoscopically would have a 15 to 20% hernia rate. And early in my career, it was great because you could um, uh, you'd get 20% of hernias to fix laparoscopically. It was a kind of fun operation. But as I get older now, I'm tired of like finding hernias. And so I've gone a little bit of old school, you know, um, and I'll ask this to, uh, to any of my partners. If you had a uh, total proctal colectomy done in the 1950s or 60s, how was the incision made? John, you want to shout out? How they paramedian. Do? Yeah, they did a left paramedian for a proctal colectomy. Why did they do that? Well, my dad was a surgeon who trained in the 50s and 60s. And it's like they had wound infections. They had dehiscences. So you do a paramedian because you have meat and two layers of fascia. So I now on right colectomies, I'll do an off midline paramedian extraction because I'm tired of the hernias. And there's good data coming from Cleveland Clinic. Shout out to Herman Kessler, who put the paper together looking at their experience that off midline has a lower hurting rate than midline. So I avoid some of the midline. So sorry um, to interrupt, just a quick question on that. Yeah. So we briefly mentioned an intracorporeal anastomosis, yeah. um, which I think the, I, I think that's great. But, but my understanding of the study is the best benefit of that is that you have an off center extraction site. So would you be interested in a intracorporeal anastomosis? Or sure, and is I've your done answer doing a paramedian? I think the, and I think you can, but now I'll, I'll tell you two things. And, and to Pat Sill and their group, uh, Barry Salky at Sinai, who, who really promoted intracorporeal anastomosis, but I'll do it la straight lap, you know, uh, but I think if you need a robot to suture or want to use a robot to suture, a great use of technology to really be sure. I'm going to air leak test that sucker though when I do it. Um, and uh, I think it's the best advantage is for the really obese patient, because if you try to do an extracorporeal anastomosis in a really obese patient, you've got to pull the colon up through five inches of belly wall. That is the patient who gets the best benefit from an intracorporeal anastomosis, is the morbidly obese patient with a big panis versus a skinny lady. I think you can extract probably through a nice little paramedian incision. So I think intracorporeal anastomosis is helpful. It costs more money and it takes more time. So you've got to be prepared for that. Um, so I, I, I don't my mind up to it. Sure, I think it's a great anastomosis. Go ahead, Lyle. Now, now just, to, just to sort of uh, zoom into the air leak that you mentioned, yeah. uh, I guess you, talk, you talked about minimizing, you know, minimizing everything, being bowel and incision. And so yeah. can you tell us about your technique for both air leak and trying to minimize um, the exposure? Yeah, so, I, so we'll do them, um, you know, uh, laparoscopically. But I literally test even around uh, to the right side. And that gets into sort of another concept. And I'll get into this if you just give me a sec. So question of diversion, right? Should we divert with an ileostomy or a colostomy? Well, if you look at old data, there were randomized studies done uh, many times that showed no benefit to the colostomy over the ileostomy. But yeah, I'll, I'll put forward in today's world, we're pushing ERAS, trying to get patients home in three or four days. And if you have a loop ileostomy for your diversion, which we still divert a lot of patients, um, the biggest problem is dehydration. So I got tired of the dehydration. And so I took the old concept of maybe we should do a diverting loop colostomy, a, a European influence if you put at it. Uh, and maybe we should bring that back. So I've done proximal transverse loop colostomy. Well, if you're gonna do a proximal transverse loop colostomy for a diverting procedure after rectal cancer, you got two problems now. You benefit because they don't get dehydrated. Rarely, and hopefully we'll show you some data to prove that. But now you've got a, a, a stoma to close uh, that's not the ileum, and you've got a wound that's bigger. So what we do for the closure is I'll do an unraveling 
of the colostomy. They bring up the loop, unravel it, and close it like a Heineken mixed with stricturoplasty. You know, and I got that from, uh, from my days in Cleveland. Uh, and then, uh, but when I do it, I'm going to want to early test it. So I, I will pull it up. I'll do a hand-sewn closure, put a clip at it, uh, and then we'll drop it down, tilt the patient, and then pass the scope up to early test the closure site. So you can even around the right side through a little incision, you can still do an early test. Now, in terms of the hernias, which I told you I hate, power colostomy hernias. I mean, we have this big stoma and we try to pull it together or you put a patch of mesh on. So a concept that I thought about is, Raga, what are we doing now as a most common procedure for non-mesh management of ventral hernias? Component separation, anterior component separation. Yeah, component separation. So, so I asked the question, I'll ask Avery. Avery, Avery, are you still there? Good. Avery, if you have a paracolostomy hernia, um, have you ever thought about maybe just dissecting out more laterally and dividing the, um, the external oblique fascia and do a component separation to combine that with your closure of the colostomy hernia? I can't say I've thought about doing that. All right, but doesn't it kind of make sense? Like it's only, you only have to go no. about three or four centimeters. Like, and you're just gonna make a little incision, right? And then now the lateral edge of the fascia comes over easy, a couple centimeters. And now I don't need to slap a piece of mesh on. And so we've done this now, and I think we'll try to show some stuff. So I think you look at other concepts from elsewhere and where can you bring it into your practice? So, and then try to find the solutions to your problem. So the problem one was, I don't like high ileostomy uh, dehydration issues. So I bring in colostomy. So I got to manage how I'm going to close it. And I do that with a closure, a heineken Mikowitz and a, and a leak test. And how do I manage the hernia? Manage that with a component separation. I'll stop there. Um, thank you very much. I, I'm just curious with the colostomy. I can't stop asking questions. Yeah, with ahead. the colostomy, it seems to be a fairly proximal thing. Do you treat it like you would an ileostomy, meaning do you brook it? Um, is there any problems with the skin when you do that? I don't know. Angela, Angela, you've done a couple. What do you think? No, so I, I bought into this and I saw a patient back today, actually a, a retired surgeon who I did this on um, a couple months ago. Um, he is going to need um, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. So he's going to live with his stoma through his um, period of chemotherapy, so six months of chemotherapy. Um, and I feel much better about the fact that he has a colostomy. He um, passes stool about two or three times a day out of its proximal loop transverse colostomy. I do brook them. Um, they do end up a little less, definitely less cosmetic than a loop ileostomy because they do stick out some more. Um, but but it's it's temporary and kind of balancing the challenges of the dehydration that we see so much with the ileostomies with the really is a significant um, decrease in output, um, just keeping the ascending colon in the system, I think is a huge benefit. 12 inches, Vlad, makes a huge difference. You don't really need to brook it. You can, uh, one side of it. it the stool is, is usually uh, more than thin liquid and they don't have skin troubles. Go ahead, what else? Right, um, well, um, I, think, I think those points have been fantastic. And I think they to me, they highlight the balance between trying to be systematic and reproducible in your technique, but also then incorporating and considering how you can, you know, how you can make your approaches um, better. So, I mean, as I've mentioned already, we talked about putting the clip on last week yeah, when we were right. preparing for the meeting, and I certainly adopted that. So there's there's a lot for me to to be inspired about, and hopefully um, the audience, including maybe some of the people that might watch it on YouTube, will will get some inspiration of of trying some things uh, which make sense and seem to be very, fairly safe to to do. Yeah, I'm just gonna say I think I think the goal is don't stick with what you're doing. See if there's something else you can do to make it better. And I think there's always something you can do to do better. And if you're just doing the same thing you did 30 years ago, you're a dinosaur. You've got to keep moving. You've got to keep adapting uh, through your career. Uh, and that's why every day is fun. Well, thank, thank you all. So thanks the um, Leahy Clinic Department for, for hosting this. Um, I think it's been very interesting and educational. Thanks everyone for attending and uh, please uh, join us next month, uh, which is um, which is going to be in Stanford, and we're going to focus on the pelvic floor. Okay. Thanks a lot very much. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.